So to, a lot of times people want to just get started by talking about what happened to these big financial institutions in 2008. Like what, we saw investment banks get in big trouble and incredible transformations of Wall Street that we saw. But this is really getting ahead of ourselves. I mean, the, the question isn't why did they fall? The question, first of all, is why did they rise so high? Where did this all come from? And in this crisis, of course, housing plays a central role, as, as you all know. So we, we tend to look there. And I would like to pledge right now that this is the last time in my career I am going to talk about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I'm never going to talk about them again. That, that's it. I'm sick of it. No one wants to hear them. You want to throw rocks at people who mention them. They were so-called government-sponsored enterprises. So that is to say they were not government-owned or run but they were not, at the same time, purely private institutions either. They had all manner of special tax and regulatory advantages not shared by other institutions. They had a special uh, lifeline to the U.S. Treasury, a special credit line. And it was more or less taken for granted that if, if it ever came to that, that line of credit with the Treasury would be more or less unlimited. And that seems to have been the basis on which they acted. I've got some juicy quotations from executives at Freddie Mac more or less saying that, that, yeah, well, when thing, we, we, all, we knew all along that if housing really collapsed, that you know, the federal government would, would have our back. So it's not like they were saying we were really worried that we would have to stand or fall on our own merits. Now, they, they didn't really have that illusion. So, no, it wasn't an explicit bailout guarantee. It was a wink-wink, nudge-nudge bailout guarantee. So... These institutions became the primary purchasers of, of, uh, of mortgage loans. And so you have these products, by the way. I mean, I, I, again, I'm, I assume people very much against their will during the crisis became knowledgeable about mortgage-backed securities. But these are products that one might buy that entitle you to a, 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 a fraction of the stream of mortgage payments that are coming from a variety of of home mortgages that have been bundled together into an instrument like this. And so Fannie and Freddie would buy these mortgages, uh, buy buy these products, and then make make, um, investment vehicles out of them, in effect. And, in fact, I I think our own home mortgage, when we had a mortgage on one of our houses, was actually bought by Fannie Mae. We got a letter saying that uh, such such and such bank down the street doesn't hold your mortgage anymore. Fannie Mae holds it. So that's that's what it means. And they were the most frequent... Uh, buyers. And so if Fannie and Freddie had not stood ready to buy a lot of these mortgages from the banks, many of them would not have been extended in the first place. So, for example, Countrywide, which was an example of a bank that got into big trouble, sold about 90 percent of its loans to, to Fannie and Freddie. And so Fannie and Freddie now would be entitled to the, the stream of payments, and then the banks would get the dough from Fannie and Freddie. Now, there, there was an incentive. There was a, uh, an incentive for banks to do this. And the incentive, it turns out, can be identified with uh, what are called, uh, sometimes called prudential regulations or capital requirements. So if you were, if you had extended a traditional loan, any, any old type of loan, it was understood that you had to hold, let's say you extended a loan for $100, some just ordinary loan, $100. You had to hold $10 in capital against that loan. If you made a real estate loan, you had to hold only $5 in capital. So you could lend you could lend out ninety five and only hold, hold five. Um, if if you, but if you if you bought uh, a triple A rated mortgage backed security, which is just thought to be you know just can't possibly fail, you only had to hold two dollars in reserve for every hundred dollars. So the incentive therefore was to rush into this type of asset so that you could you would only have to hold such a small amount of of, of capital. And in fact, the real incentive was to to extend a mortgage loan to somebody and then sell it to package it, have it be packaged and sold, uh, and, and then go get rid of that mortgage and then buy it back, in effect, in the form of a mortgage backed security. And then you could lend out more because the capital requirement was lower if you had a mortgage backed security as opposed to a traditional real estate loan on your books. So all the incentives were in place for banks to do this. And as a result, there was a massive uh, flight into this type of asset. And normally, you would think there would be a, more of a distribution among asset classes in terms of some of these financial institutions' portfolios. But 
when regulatory arbitrage encourages institutions to buy one particular asset at the expense of others, it's no surprise that they all cluster into this one kind. And then when this particular type of asset turned out to be of far lower quality than people believed, then you have a big problem on your hands because a whole lot of institutions are holding on to them. And that's what we wound up seeing. Fannie and Freddie tended to be uh, quite willing to take risks and to absorb risky mortgages. Uh, the, the CEO of Fannie Mae actually said in emails that we, we now have, thanks to the NSA, where actually I don't know how we got these emails, but he's, he told employees to get aggressive on risk, on risk taking or get out of the company. And they listened to that, uh, apparently, as it turns out. In fact, also, they had, we heard a lot during the crisis of uh, leverage and that a lot of firms were highly leveraged, which means that they, uh, their strategy was based on borrowing an awful lot of, of, of money and using that borrowed money to buy uh, high-powered assets. Well, Fannie and Freddie were as leveraged as anybody, more leveraged than the major investment banks were. They, they, their leverage ratio was about 60 to 1. So they had $83 billion in capital covering $5 trillion in liabilities. So in mid-2008, they are really getting in major, major trouble. And Hank Paulson, who was a, that's sort of a blast from the past, remember our old, old Treasury Secretary from, from the old days? Hank Paulson was asked, well, do you... What do you think about this? Are, are they in trouble or are they adequately capitalized? And Paulson said, quote, their, their regulator has made clear that they are adequately capitalized. And then two months later, basically the federal government nationalizes them and Paulson is back on TV and this is quoted back at him. Didn't you just tell us in July that their regulator, you know, that you said they're, they're adequately capitalized. And he said, no, no, no. He said, this is what he said, I never said the company was well capitalized. What I said is, the regulator said they are adequately capitalized. <laughs> and I guess that is technically true. That is indeed what he said. But some people, sticklers, might think that that was a misleading statement. But. <laughs> okay, so but what's interesting, though, is what reveals that people more or less knew that there may as well have been an explicit bailout guarantee for Fannie and Freddie uh, if some of these loans really began to go bad, was how cheaply they were able to borrow. I mean, the U.S. government is considered to be uh, a very low risk of, of bankruptcy. And so the U.S. government can borrow super-duper cheaply. Well, pretty much Fannie and Freddie were able to borrow at uh, one percentage point higher than the U.S. government was able to, to borrow at. And from 2000 to 2006, at a time when the, the risk element of uh, Fannie and Freddie's holdings was growing substantially... Their borrowing costs held steady with those of the U.S. government or even fell in relation to, to uh, the U.S. government. So that, that should make clear that, that people who actually had skin in the game also thought that there was no chance that Fannie and Freddie would just be allowed to go under. Well, we look at all the different institutions that had any type of hand in, in housing, and that would include Fannie and Freddie, yes, but also the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, the Federal Housing Administration, or FHA, the Federal Reserve, all these institutions were all putting out orders that banks have got to extend loans in circumstances that they, which they wouldn't normally extend them, and they need to be much more liberal in their, in their loan origination. They need to be willing to extend uh, no-doc mortgages, which means somebody just comes in and says, uh, uh, I, you know, I'd like to get a mortgage loan, and, and you say, well, do you have a job? And, and, and they say, yeah, and then that's it. Like, there's no... <laughs> letter from their boss or, you know, a, a, a stub from their paycheck or anything. And, and that's just sort of okay. And so this sort of thing was, was being done repeatedly. And then the FHA, meanwhile, the FHA's programs were supposed to help low-income people become uh, homeowners. So under Bill Clinton, the, the secretary of, of, uh, of HUD broadened the scope of what the FHA was doing and doubled the upper limit of FHA loans. So FHA loans could be, they could guarantee up to $235,000 in the 1990s uh, in terms of, of mortgage loans. They, you only had to put 3% down. And then the Bush administration pushed this ahead uh, uh, even farther, more and more and more. And so all these institutions are pushing on housing lenders or are themselves engaged in practices that would have been considered laughable uh, in, in previous years. So the result of this, this is without even getting into the Federal Reserve, 
uh, with more and more people going into home ownership, this is going to push up housing prices. And then, of course, the role of Greenspan is, uh, is going to be evident as well. But this is going to push up housing prices. And the higher housing prices then leads to a kind of a feedback loop. Because now that housing prices have been bid up because people get all these special privileges, so now they're, if you only have to put 3% down or 0% down, more people will do it. So there's greater demand. More people want to get into the housing market. More people specifically want to get into home ownership. Well, that makes the prices of houses go up. And when the prices of houses go up, now people say, well, I need a bigger loan in order to be able to get into a house. I need easier terms for the loan. I, I need, to be, I need the, the banking institutions to be more lax in what they require of me. And so the, it, it just feeds into, uh, into itself. In fact, it's the same sort of thing we see with education. The federal government gets involved in education and makes all these programs available, particularly subsidized loans, to students. And then this pushes up the price of education, which then in turn makes the students demand more loans, which makes education get more expensive, then we need more loans. And this is what the federal government calls affordable education or affordable housing. It's not that the prices come down. What are you, some kind of simpleton? If you think of affordability means low prices, it doesn't mean low prices. It means sky high prices, but we'll extend you loans that will make you a debt slave for the rest of your life so you can afford it. That's what they mean by affordable. They don't actually mean that the price comes down. And so the statistics are just unbelievable in terms of how much, uh, how many mortgages you had people with no, no down payments or no doc mortgages and so on. So then after 2008 comes along and we started to see defaults and and major problems occurring, people began to notice that the FHA in 2008, with with the housing market in in dire straits, is continuing to back risky loans and and low down payment loans. And just in a matter of a couple of years, the FHA had gone from guaranteeing 2% of mortgages to over 20% of mortgages. And the stimulus of 2008 included a provision that said that the maximum loan that the FHA can insure is now $729,750. This is so this is to help low-income people buy houses. And before I came up here, I asked Bob Murphy, is there any possible rationale that the FHA, which exists for low-income people, is there any conceivable reason that they could have for insuring a house that sells for almost $730,000. Like, is there some big thing that I'm not getting? And it was hard to think of an innocent explanation for this, but this sort of thing just went on. And people, well, that's, that's just the way it goes. That's how the government is. So what you had then were all these various, and there are many others as well, but all these various pressures that tended to increase the extent to which people were interested in home ownership specifically as opposed to renting or, you know, living with their parents or whatever they were doing before. Now they want to all, all go out and take advantage of these programs. But then you combine that with an expansionary monetary policy, and a lot of that money then is going to tend to go into the housing market because this is sort of the big thing. In fact, uh, I'm probably not being as elegant as he would be, but Professor Garrison has sometimes said that a lot of times when you look at the Austrian business cycle, in particular cases, you'll notice that in the 1990s, for instance, it was dot-com stocks that were particularly distorted. Or, you know, sometimes you'll see there's a particular area that's especially distorted. And so it's, it's like the, the, the uh, expansionary monetary policy is like piggybacking on whatever the big thing is, it then latches onto and distorts, and, and, uh, and that seems to have been what happened in this particular case. But in this case, it, it, it was housing.